Welcome to the Unsolved Mysteries Iceberg Part 4, where we explore some of the most fascinating and dark unsolved mysteries. On this iceberg, we deep dive unsolved mysteries, including true crime, myths and legends, strange events, cryptids, urban legends, internet mysteries, and more. Let's go down the rabbit hole. But first, hit the like button and make sure to subscribe. Celine Delgado Lopez. Celine Delgado Lopez is an alleged missing girl from Mexico who has captivated the internet in the last few years. Starting in the late 1990s, Canal 5, a Mexican television channel, had a tradition of airing a public interest announcement late at night. These segments were dedicated to community service, featuring the names of missing individuals in the hopes that viewers could assist in locating them by reporting any information to the authorities. However, in 2001, one missing person's case stood out, Celine Delgado Lopez, a missing 18-year-old girl. Unlike the detailed profiles of other missing individuals, the only details shared about Celine were her name, age, and the fact that she disappeared in Mexico City, leaving a mysterious gap in her story. The intrigue around Celine Delgado Lopez escalated when viewers reported feeling uneasy and scared upon seeing her photo during the broadcast. Some viewers even allegedly claimed that the television channel would freeze or glitch for a few minutes and then abruptly switch to static whenever her image was displayed. As the rumors evolved, more modern theories suggesting that Celine's nondescript appearance and generic facial expression indicated she might not be a real person, but rather her image was generated by artificial intelligence. This theory prompted further investigation by internet sleuths, which revealed that there were no public records of Celine Delgado's disappearance. Adding to the intrigue, the photograph was broadcast for years after, suggesting she had not been found. There's a whole bunch of potential theories on the Celine Delgado Lopez case. However, the only thing known for certain is that the image of this girl was broadcast in 2001. One theory is that Delgado Lopez is a fictional character, an urban legend that originated from Canal 5. This creation was intended not just to spook viewers, but also to highlight the importance of vigilance and safety for Mexico's youth. Others speculate that Delgado Lopez's persona was also purportedly the result of a hoax, where an individual submitted a fabricated photo and profile to Canal 5. However, the theory that I prefer is that she is likely a real teenager who went missing circa 2001. Her parents submitted her photograph and her name, and the low-quality image was simply the result of technology at the time. Further, the lack of updates or any police records could be explained by her being a runaway who returned home to her family. However, unusually, Canal 5 has made cryptic references to Celine Delgado Lopez on their Twitter account, lending credence to the idea that she was a fictitious creation of the TV station. The idea of using a real unsolved missing teenager for the purpose of promoting a Twitter account would obviously cross some serious moral and ethical boundaries. That said, if anyone is more familiar with Canal 5, let me know if this would be within the MO of the station in the comments below. King Ludwig II, the fairy tale king. Ludwig II of Bavaria, often referred to as the fairy tale king, or less favorably, Mad King Ludwig, was born on August 25, 1845, in the Kingdom of Bavaria, now part of modern Germany. His reign, which began in 1864, was marked by personal eccentricity and extravagant architectural projects, rather than political achievements. Ludwig's mysterious death on June 13, 1886, has sparked much speculation and intrigue, remaining a topic of debate and analysis to this day. Ludwig was the eldest son of King Maximilian II of Bavaria and Queen Marie. Raised in the privileged and isolated environment of the Bavarian court, Ludwig developed a keen interest in arts, 
architecture, and music from an early age, particularly the works of Richard Wagner, whom he later patronized extensively. Ludwig ascended to the throne at the age of 18 following his father's death. His initial years were marked by enthusiasm and progressive ideas, but he quickly became disillusioned with the day-to-day -day duties of kingship, preferring instead to focus on artistic and architectural projects. Ludwig's reign saw the construction of several extravagant castles and palaces, the most famous being Neuschwanstein Castle, a fantastical creation set against the Bavarian Alps, which has since become an iconic symbol of Germany, and perhaps the most famous castle in the world, with a little help from Walt Disney. Other notable constructions include Linderhof Palace and Herrenchimse Palace, each reflecting Ludwig's admiration for Louis XIV of France and his desire to escape from reality into a world of romantic idealism. Despite their beauty, these projects were extremely costly, leading to severe financial strain on Bavaria's treasury. Ludwig financed these endeavors through personal debt rather than state funds, which further complicated the financial situation. Ludwig was known for his reclusive lifestyle, often avoiding public appearances and state affairs. He preferred the solitude of his castles, where he indulged in his fantasies. Ludwig's personal life was subject to speculation, including rumors about his sexuality and mental health. By the 1880s, Ludwig's behavior and financial extravagance alarmed the Bavarian government and his family to such a degree that they needed a plan to remove him. In 1886, a government commission declared Ludwig mentally unfit to rule, citing his extravagant projects and reclusive behavior as evidence of insanity. Ludwig was deposed and interned at Berg Castle on Lake Starnberg. Just days after his deposition, on June 13, 1886, Ludwig and his psychiatrist, Dr. Bernhard von Gooden, were found dead in shallow water near the castle under mysterious circumstances. The official cause of death was declared as self-ending by drowning for both men, but this explanation has been widely questioned. There were no signs of struggle, and Ludwig was known to be a strong swimmer. Furthermore, the autopsy report indicated that Ludwig's body showed no signs of water inhalation, a detail that contradicts the drowning theory. Further yet, Dr. Von Gooden's body showed signs of struggle, suggesting he had been slain. Also, to add another layer to the mystery, personal notes were found from Ludwig's personal fisherman after the fisherman's death. The fisherman was advised that there were quote-unquote certain things he may never speak about, and in return, his family would be looked after. These personal notes indicate that the fisherman had made a deal with Ludwig to help Ludwig escape from his internment at Berg Castle. To paraphrase a popular saying from the last few years in a YouTube-friendly manner, Ludwig didn't consensually end his existence. The Ark of the Covenant The Ark of the Covenant as described in the Bible, is a wooden chest containing the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. It is one of the most sacred artifacts for all Abrahamic faiths, symbolizing the divine presence of God and playing a central role in religious rituals. Despite its significance, the whereabouts of the Ark have been shrouded in mystery for centuries leading to numerous theories and speculations about its fate and location. The Ark was constructed by the Israelites while in the wilderness of Sinai, following instructions given to Moses by God. It was housed in the tabernacle and later in the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem upon settlement there. The Ark served not only as a physical manifestation of God's presence, but also as a symbol of the covenant between God and the Israelites. It was carried into battle, consulted for divine guidance, and involved in significant religious ceremonies. The Ark's disappearance is not explicitly documented in the Bible, leading to various interpretations and theories. 
The most commonly accepted theory is that it was either hidden or destroyed during the Babylonian conquest of Jerusalem in 586 BC. During the sack of the city, the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple. However, there is no direct evidence to support this, and the Ark's fate remains a topic of speculation. Several theories have emerged regarding the Ark's whereabouts. One popular theory suggests that the Ark was hidden by the priesthood before the Babylonian attack to prevent its capture. Locations proposed for its hiding place include underneath the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, in caves near the Dead Sea, or even in Ethiopia, where the Ethiopian Orthodox Church claims it resides in the Church of Our Lady, Mary of Zion in Aksum. Another theory posits that the Ark was taken to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar's forces as part of the temple treasures. However, interestingly, the Babylonians did document their looting of Jerusalem, and the Ark is not listed among the items recorded in the Babylonian account of the treasures looted from the temple, casting doubt on this theory. It is of course possible that someone amongst the Babylonian forces noted the value of the Ark and looted it personally. Also, it's entirely possible that the tablet that recorded the Ark's looting has itself been lost to history. The mystery of the Ark has prompted numerous searches and expeditions over the centuries. Archaeologists, historians, and treasure hunters have explored potential locations in the Middle East and Africa based on historical records, religious texts, and local legends. Despite these efforts, no verifiable evidence of the Ark's existence or location has been found. To go back to the Ethiopian claim, only one person is allowed to see or interact with it, and that's the monk appointed for life as a guardian of the Ark. However, the Ethiopian tradition claims the Ark came to Ethiopia during the time of King Solomon, which cannot be possible given that King Solomon lived centuries before the Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem. A British officer claims to have personally examined the Ark, including inside the Ark in 1941, and found the Ark to be an empty chest of medieval origin. In my view, the Ethiopian story was likely intended to give legitimacy to the House of Solomon, which ruled Ethiopia from the 13th century AD to the 20th century. Al Swearingen. Al Swearingen a notable figure of the American Old West, is best known for his ownership of the Gem Theater, a notorious house of ill repute in Deadwood, South Dakota, during the late 19th century. His life, steeped in controversy and criminal activities, ended under mysterious circumstances that remain unsolved to this day. Swearingen arrived in Deadwood in 1876, capitalizing on the Black Hills Gold Rush. The Gem Theater, under his ownership and management, became infamous for its offerings of gambling, liquor, and other more illicit activities. Swearingen's reputation was that of a ruthless businessman who wouldn't hesitate to exploit others for profit. Also, if you're wondering why his name sounds so familiar and it hasn't hit you yet, he was a central and memorable character from the HBO show Deadwood. In November 1904, Swearingen's body was found on a Denver, Colorado street, with initial reports suggesting he had fallen or been thrown from a high bridge, leading to speculation about his slaying. Despite the violent and suspicious circumstances surrounding his death, no conclusive evidence was ever presented to solve the case. Theories about his demise range from robbery gone wrong given that he was known to carry significant sums of money in his past life, to a premeditated attack by an enemy from his past life in Deadwood. With regard to the robbery theory, while he was broke at the time of his death, this likely wasn't common knowledge amongst people who knew him in the preceding decades. Research into Swearingen's death is complicated by the lack of reliable historical records and the passage of time, which has obscured many details. Also, to add one more twist to this mystery, Swearingen had a twin brother. Two months prior to his slaying, Al Swearingen's twin brother was shot under mysterious circumstances. 
To me, this strongly suggests the fatal attack was carried out by someone with a vendetta stemming back from his days in Deadwood. However, at this point, the truth will likely never be known. Mary Agnes Gross. In 1962, Marlis Janice Thomas was told her newborn, Mary Agnes Gross, died hours after birth in Worthington, Minnesota. Marley saw her daughter alive, but after sedation, was informed of her death without a clear cause. Doubts arose due to a mismatch in the baby's appearance at the funeral home and the hospital's refusal of an autopsy. A few months after, she received a mysterious letter in the mail containing a picture of a family with a newborn daughter. No return address was listed, nor was there a letter attached. Years later, discrepancies surfaced about Mary Agnes's burial. Investigations showed paperwork errors, including a funeral document with Mary Agnes's name and conflicting hospital records. Further, in 1989, another headstone was placed on Mary Agnes's plot, indicating that a baby named Pamela Ray Dickey was buried there. In 1996, after a significant legal battle, the alleged body of Mary Agnes was exhumed and a DNA test was conducted. Well, at this point, you can probably guess the twist. The quote unquote, body of Mary Agnes Gross did not match Marley's Thomas. The DNA tests on exhumed remains coupled with the mysterious photo received years earlier showing a family with a baby resembling Marlies's estranged husband, led Marlies to believe Mary Agnes was adopted by another family. She suspected hospital staff, thinking she couldn't care for her baby as a newly single mother, facilitated the adoption. Shakespeare's Lost Play, Love's Labors One. Love's Labors One is a purported work by William Shakespeare that has intrigued scholars and enthusiasts for centuries, primarily because it is mentioned in several contemporary sources, but no copies of it have been found. Nothing is known about this supposed play, and it is primarily known from a 1598 list of Shakespeare works and a bookseller's catalog from 1603 that lists it as a separate title. One theory that has gained traction over the years is that Love's Labors One is not a lost play, but an alternative title for another known Shakespeare play, with The Taming of the Shrew being a prime candidate. The theory posits that Love's Labors One was a subtitle or an earlier title for The Taming of the Shrew, suggesting a thematic connection between the two. The Taming of the Shrew deals with courtship and marriage, fitting the implication of a sequel to Love's Labors Lost a play centered around the comedic mishaps of love. Shakespearean scholars have noted that there are no direct narrative links between Love's Labor's Lost and The Taming of the Shrew that would explicitly confirm the latter as a sequel. Further, the idea that Love's Labor's One could be an alternate title for The Taming of the Shrew is bolstered by the then common practice of assigning multiple titles to plays there's one idea I didn't see discussed in my research for this. And as a quick aside, I've enjoyed researching lost media for some time now. I haven't seen the theory that the 1598 list simply contained an erroneous title. After all, in 1598, you simply couldn't go to the library and look up a catalog of Shakespeare's works. We don't know the source of knowledge on the inclusion of this supposed play in the 1598 list. The 1603 catalog may have simply copied the 1598 list. Basically, what I'm proposing is that Love's Labors I could be the 16th century equivalent of Yeah, Yeah, Bebus I, discussed in part one of this iceberg. Jody Husentrout. Jody Husentrout was a 27-year-old news anchor for KIMT, a CBS affiliate in Mason City, Iowa, who disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Huizentrout was born on June 5, 1968 in Long Prairie, Minnesota. She developed an early interest in broadcasting, leading her to pursue a degree in mass communications from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. 
After graduation, Husen Trude embarked on her journalism career, working in various small markets, including Cedar Rapids, Iowa, before settling in Mason City, Iowa. Known for her dedication and vibrant personality, Husen Trude quickly became a familiar face in the community, engaging viewers with her warmth. Her disappearance on June 27, 1995, remains unsolved, marking the start of what has become a very significant cold case in Iowa history. Husen Trude was reported missing after failing to show up for her morning news segment. The previous evening, she had played golf with friends and was reportedly in good spirits. Concerns were raised when Husen Trude didn't arrive at work by 4 a.m. for her shift, prompting a colleague to call her. Husen Trude answered, mentioning she was on her way, but she never arrived. Evidence at her apartment complex suggested a struggle. Husen Trude's red Mazda Miata was found in the parking lot, along with her personal items scattered around, including her shoes, hairspray, blow dryer, and earrings. The key to her car was bent, found in the lock of the trunk, indicating a possible abduction scenario. There were also signs of a struggle, including a palm print on her vehicle that has never been matched to a suspect. Despite extensive searches, no further evidence was found in the vicinity. Investigations into Husen Trude's disappearance initially focused on her personal and professional life. Authorities interviewed friends, family, and co-workers, but no substantial leads were developed. Over the years, various theories have been proposed, including potential stalking, as Husen Trude had expressed concerns about unfamiliar individuals around her home before her disappearance. Another theory considered was her investigation into drug activity in the area, which might have put her in danger, though evidence supporting this is limited. The case received national attention, with coverage on television programs such as America's Most Wanted and Unsolved Mysteries, generating tips, but no breakthroughs. She was ultimately declared legally dead in May 2001. However, despite that, her case is still being actively investigated by the authorities. Okay, everyone, time for a super quick plug. Since you've made it this far, I would really appreciate if you hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell. This helps my channel spread and grow. I'm devoting a larger and larger portion of my time to this channel and content creation, so expect a ton of new content in the near future. Also, calling on you absolute chads and chadettes, join up on the Patreon or the YouTube membership. Both links are in the description. Now back to our iceberg. Longinus, the Spear of Destiny. The Spear of Destiny, also known as the Holy Lance or the Lance of Longinus, holds a significant place in Christian mythology and historical lore. It's said to be the lance that a Roman soldier, identified in the Gospel of John as Longinus, used to pierce the side of Jesus Christ during the crucifixion. The Spear of Destiny's narrative roots trace back to New Testament biblical accounts, specifically the Gospel of John, which describes how Jesus, already perished, was pierced by a Roman soldier to confirm his death, leading to a sudden outpouring of blood and water. Early Christian tradition expanded on this event, granting the spear sacred status due to its direct contact with Jesus. Christian tradition also holds that the Roman soldier who did the act converted to Christianity, and he is today revered as a saint. Over the centuries, this relic has been imbued with mystical properties, including the power to grant victory and protection to its possessor, making it a coveted artifact among rulers and military leaders. The spear's documented history is as complex as the legends surrounding it, with several spears claimed to be the genuine article across various locations in Europe. The most famous of these is housed in the Hofburg Palace in Vienna, Austria. This spear was part of the imperial regalia of the Holy Roman Empire, and its history is well documented from the 10th century onwards. 
Otto the Great was the first verified owner of the spear in this chain of custody. However, previous leaders such as Constantine the Great and Charles the Great, Charlemagne, are also said to have possessed it. All Holy Roman Emperors after were at least nominally in possession of the Spear of Destiny, including rulers such as Charles V, who was the first person who was said to preside over an empire on which the sun never sets. Perhaps the most famous purported owner of the Spear was Hitler, who was said to have taken direct possession of it after the annexation of Austria in 1938. The Germans hid all the imperial regalia of the Holy Roman Empire in a bunker in Nuremberg through the war, though it was recovered and returned to the Hofburg Palace after the end of the conflict. As for the power associated with the spear, regardless of its authenticity, I have to believe that possession of such a powerful artifact has, at the very least, a psychological effect that can warp the reality of the possessor. Sandown Clown the Sandown Clown is a lesser-known yet intriguing paranormal figure. This entity was reportedly encountered in 1973 on the Isle of Wight, England, by two young children, sparking a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Unlike traditional ghost stories or urban legends, the Sandown Clown's appearance and behavior were distinctly unusual, blending elements of the eerie and the absurd. On a summer day in 1973, two children were playing near a disused airfield in Sandown when they heard a peculiar whining sound, like a siren. Investigating its source, they stumbled upon a structure from which the noise seemed to emanate. Approaching closer, they were confronted by a bizarre figure, an entity resembling a clown, but with several unsettling features that set it apart from any typical circus performer or entertainer. This figure was described as being nearly seven feet tall, with a bald head except for a fringe of red hair, small, high-set eyes that were likened to portholes, and a large, drooping mouth that never moved when it spoke. Perhaps most bizarre of all, the entity communicated with the children, expressing loneliness and a desire for companionship, yet it exhibited behaviors and abilities that were anything but human. During the encounter, the clown demonstrated the ability to appear and disappear at will, moving in ways that defied natural explanation. It led the children to the back of the hut, revealing a hidden area that seemed inconsistent with the hut's exterior dimensions. The conversation between the entity and the children touched on topics ranging from the clown's personal loneliness to cryptic remarks about its origins and nature. The Sandown Clown did not exhibit overtly malevolent behavior during the encounter, but its appearance and actions left the children unsettled. They eventually left the scene, looking back to see the figure watching them from a distance before it vanished. The experience deeply affected both children, leading to immediate reports to parents, and subsequently, investigations by paranormal researchers. The investigation into the Sandown Clown has yielded more questions than answers. Skeptics suggest the encounter could be a misinterpreted sighting of a local eccentric or a prankster. Yet no satisfactory explanation has been provided for the entity's bizarre appearance and capabilities, as described by the children. The lack of additional sightings and the singular nature of the encounter add to the mystery with some proposing explanations, ranging from extraterrestrial visitors to interdimensional beings. Critically, the Sandown Clown incident stands out for its unique blend of elements from both ghostly apparitions and encounters with otherworldly entities. The detailed descriptions provided by the children, their evident distress, and the lack of any clear motive or explanation challenge easy dismissal of the event as mere fantasy or fabrication. Personally, since finding out about the Sandown Clown a few months ago, I've been fascinated with the story, and I'm surprised it isn't more well known. The Disappearance of Susan Walsh. Susan Walsh, a journalist, vanished on July 16, 1996, 
after leaving her apartment in Nutley, New Jersey. Walsh was last seen leaving her home, reportedly to use a payphone. She never returned, and no trace of her has been found since. At the time of her disappearance, Walsh was involved in investigative journalism, working on stories about the Russian mafia, human trafficking, and also the underground vampire subculture in New York City. Her work was considered risky and led to speculation that her disappearance was connected to her investigations. Walsh also struggled with personal issues, including substance abuse and financial difficulties. She was also going through a contentious divorce, adding layers of complexity to her life situation. A number of theories have been proposed to explain her disappearance. The prevailing theory is that Walsh's disappearance was related to her journalistic work, especially her investigations into the Russian mafia and human trafficking. She had reportedly received threats because of her work, suggesting a possible motive for foul play. Another popular theory stems from the fact that in an interview two days before her disappearance, she made reference to having a stalker. I note that this stalker could be connected in some way to the previous theory. Perhaps this was not a stalker, but to put it in YouTube-friendly language, a contracted professional. Another less popular theory focuses on Walsh's personal struggles. Some speculate that she may have voluntarily disappeared to start a new life, or that her disappearance was related to her personal associations and not her professional work. However, there's absolutely no evidence to support this, and she left behind a young son. Vietnam War POWs. Post-war, the United States and Vietnam faced the monumental task of repatriating POWs. In 1973, the Paris Peace Accords led to the release of 591 American POWs. However, Allegations surfaced that hundreds of American servicemen remained captive in Southeast Asia. These claims have persisted despite numerous investigations by the U.S. government and independent organizations. Critics argue that in the rush to withdraw from Vietnam, the U.S. government failed to account for all missing servicemen. They point to discrepancies in wartime records, sightings of Americans in Vietnam post-1973, and the political and diplomatic incentives to underreport the number of POWs. The U.S. government, through efforts like the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA Affairs, found, quote, no compelling evidence that proves that any American remains alive in captivity in Southeast Asia. Yet, the issue is far from resolved for many. Further, this committee was convened in 1991 over 20 years after the Paris Peace Accords. Key to understanding this issue is the distinction between POWs and MIAs. While POWs are known to have been captured, MIAs disappeared under circumstances that make their fate uncertain. The ambiguity surrounding MIA cases contributes to the belief that some may have been taken prisoner. Given the number of captured American troops that were held in Vietnam, there is little doubt in my mind that the Paris Peace Accords did not successfully free all the POWs. I suspect that the newly united Vietnam would have had a strong incentive not to return American servicemen who had suffered in the most extreme ways while in captivity. Interestingly, much of the work bringing this issue to the public attention was done by movie stars, most famously Sylvester Stallone in Rambo First Blood Part Two. Famously, the plot of this movie turns on Rambo being sent to Vietnam to rescue POWs whose plight the American government had been ignoring. At any rate, the true fate of any remaining American POWs remains unknown, and will probably remain that way given that the Vietnamese government strongly pursues normal diplomatic and trading status with the states. Further. The sad reality is that almost anyone who was held under these circumstances is now almost certainly past, which makes the issue much less poignant than it was in the decades following the war. Wrinkles the Clown Wrinkles the Clown gained public attention around 2015 
emerging as a mysterious figure in Naples, Florida. This character, donning a distinctive creepy clown mask and costume, became known for being hired to scare children as a form of behavior correction. Wrinkles' eerie persona and unconventional service sparked widespread curiosity and concern, leading to a viral phenomenon. The inception of Wrinkles the Clown is traced back to a person who reportedly moved from Rhode Island to Florida after retirement. Choosing anonymity, the individual behind Wrinkles created a backstory for the character, which included living in a small van and offering scare services for hire. A sticker on the van advertised a phone number, inviting people to call Wrinkles, either to hire him or just to interact with the character. The phone number connected callers to a voicemail that further amplified the mystique around Wrinkles. The viral spread of Wrinkles was fueled by videos and photos showing the clown appearing in unexpected places, such as standing silently by a child's bed or lurking in a home's backyard. These appearances were uploaded to various social media platforms, leading to millions of views and a mix of horror and fascination among viewers. The content sparked debates over the appropriateness and ethics of using such a figure for disciplining children. The person behind Wrinkles has maintained anonymity, contributing to the character's mystique. Interviews and communications were conducted in character, with Wrinkles speaking in a gravelly voice, offering vague and often unsettling comments about his motivations and experiences. In 2019, the documentary Wrinkles the Clown was released providing insight into the phenomenon. As of 2024, it looks like the wrinkles phenomenon has died down significantly, and it is unclear to me if the individual behind the clown is still portraying this character. The Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley. Amy Lynn Bradley, a 23-year-old from Chesterfield County, Virginia, vanished while on a Caribbean cruise aboard the Rhapsody of the Seas a ship operated by Royal Caribbean Cruises in March 1998. Amy Bradley's family, consisting of her parents Ron and Iva Bradley and her brother Brad, embarked on a week-long cruise on March 21, 1998. The cruise was intended as a family trip, combining relaxation with the joy of exploration. Amy was seen for the last time in the early hours of March 24, 1998. She was witnessed by her family on their cabin's balcony in the wee hours, around 5.30 a.m., after attending a party on the ship. Her disappearance was noted later that morning when her family found she was not in her cabin or anywhere else on the ship. Upon realizing Amy was missing, her family immediately alerted the ship's crew, prompting a search on the vessel. They pleaded with the crew to keep all the passengers on board the ship, However, sadly, this was not done. The ship was en route to Curaçao, in the Antilles, at the time of her disappearance. Despite thorough searches of the ship and inquiries among passengers and crew, no sign of Amy was found on board. The FBI got involved, as did various other agencies, given the international waters where the disappearance occurred. However, these efforts yielded no concrete evidence or leads as to Amy's whereabouts. Investigations into Amy Bradley's disappearance faced significant challenges. The lack of security footage capturing her movements on the ship in her final hours compounded the mystery. Several passengers reported seeing Amy in the early hours of March 24th, adding credibility to the timeline established by her family. Theories about what happened ranged from accidental overboard falling to abduction. Another theory involves a potential conflict with a member of the ship's band. However, Amy is confirmed to have returned to her room on the night in question, and as discussed, she was seen by her family in the morning. Over the years, there have been reported sightings of Amy in various Caribbean islands. One notable claim came from a sailor who reported seeing her in a house of ill repute in Curaçao in 1998, suggesting she might have been kidnapped and been a victim of human trafficking. Other sightings were reported in the years following her disappearance, 
but none led to a definitive conclusion on her fate. The I-70 Killer The I-70 Killer is a term used to describe an unidentified individual responsible for a series of slayings that occurred in 1992. These acts took place along the Interstate 70 corridor, spanning across several states including Indiana, Missouri, Kansas, and Texas. This case has haunted investigators and the public for decades due to its seemingly random nature and the killer's ability to evade capture. The series of slayings began on April 8, 1992, with Robin Fuldauer in Indianapolis, Indiana. Fuldauer was a manager of a shoe store and was last spotted alive at 1.30 on that day. Her body was subsequently discovered in the back of the store. Despite the nature of the act, virtually nothing was taken from the store, suggesting robbery was not a primary motivation. Over the next three months, six more victims were slain, with the last known ending occurring on May 7, 1992. The victims were predominantly young women working alone in small retail stores or shops. There is no known motivation for the slayings. The killer only ever took nominal sums of money, and despite women being the primary target, they were thankfully not subject to indecent acts. The investigation into the I-70 murders was extensive, involving multiple law enforcement agencies across the states where the slayings occurred. Despite the efforts to find connections between the victims, no personal link was established, leading investigators to theorize that the selection of victims was opportunistic. The proximity of the crime scenes to I-70 suggested a perpetrator who was familiar with the area and possibly used the interstate for quick escapes. A significant breakthrough in the case was the discovery of ballistic evidence linking the murders together confirming the same weapon was used in each instance. Witnesses provided descriptions of a suspect, a white male of average height with a slender build, and in some cases, noted to have sandy blonde or reddish hair. Estimates of his age vary widely, with estimates ranging from him being in his early 20s to his late 30s. Composite sketches were circulated, but no definitive suspect was identified. The investigation also explored the possibility of the killer changing his appearance or using disguises to avoid detection, though again, nothing was confirmed. The case presented a number of challenges for law enforcement. Primarily, the geographic spread of the slayings across multiple jurisdictions, complicated coordination, and information sharing among agencies. No suspects have ever been publicly identified in relation to this case. The I-70 Strangler The I-70 Strangler is a term coined for an unidentified suspect believed to be responsible for a series of slayings along the Interstate 70 corridor from 1980 to 1991. Unlike the I-70 killer, who used a firearm, the Strangler's method of killing was through strangulation, pointing to a different modus operandi. Further, the two had very different victim profiles, with the Strangler targeting gay men exclusively. The series of incidents attributed to the I-70 Strangler began to surface when bodies of young men were discovered in rural areas adjacent to Interstate 70. Unlike the I-70 killer, police have publicly stated that Herb Baumeister, a suspected serial killer, was likely, though not certainly, responsible for the slayings. Unfortunately, when the police issued a warrant for his arrest in connection to a then thought to be unrelated series of serial slayings, Baumeister consensually ended himself without confessing to these horrific crimes. And yes, you heard me correctly. When this guy consented to his own end, he had been operating in a way that the authorities assumed him to be two separate serial killers. Capitol Hill Mystery Soda Machine the Capitol Hill Mystery Soda Machine was a mysterious vending machine in Seattle, Washington that garnered widespread curiosity and speculation. Located in the Capitol Hill neighborhood, this soda machine was famous for its unpredictability and mystery 
as no one knew who stocked or maintained it. Adding to its allure, the machine's buttons were labeled mystery, dispensing random soda cans, some of which were rare or hadn't been produced in years. For decades, this vintage machine, appearing to be from the late 1970s or early 1980s, stood mysteriously on the street corner. Despite its seemingly ordinary exterior, the mystery soda machine became a local legend and an odd tourist attraction. What set this machine apart was not just its age, but the fact that its selection buttons were labeled not with specific soda names, but with the word mystery. For a mere 75 cents, customers could press a button and receive a random soda can. The selection ranged from common brands to obscure and discontinued flavors, baffling those who used it. No one claimed ownership or responsibility for the machine's upkeep, and attempts to find out who refilled it led nowhere, deepening the mystery. It operated with an autonomy that seemed almost supernatural, with its contents changing and the machine itself showing signs of age but never breaking down. Speculation about the machine's origins and maintenance ranged from it being a social experiment, an art installation, to theories involving local business owners, or even more off-the-wall ideas about time travelers and parallel universes. The mystery was compounded by the lack of surveillance and the machine's consistent operation, despite never being visibly restocked during the day. In June 2018, the machine suddenly disappeared, leaving behind only a message from the supposed owners stating it had gone for a walk and needed some time to find itself. As of February 2024, the machine is apparently still out for a walk. Let's hope it finds itself soon and returns home. Mr. Cruel. The Mr. Cruel case is one of Australia's most notorious unsolved criminal cases, spanning from the late 1980s to the early 1990s in Melbourne. The first known attack attributed to Mr. Cruel occurred in August 1987, when he broke into a home in Lower Plenty, attacking two children while their parents were bound and gagged. This pattern of behavior, breaking into homes at night, binding the victims, and meticulously avoiding leaving physical evidence, became his modus operandi. His most infamous crimes involved the abduction and subsequent release of three girls from their homes between 1988 and 1990. Unfortunately, unspeakable acts were committed in the process. He is also suspected to have abducted and slain a child in 1991. Sadly, this case remains unsolved over 30 years later. Given his ability to avoid leaving behind any meaningful evidence, I have to question if he is someone involved in forensic investigations in some capacity. Rex Farrell Hitman, a technical manual for independent contractors, is a controversial book published in 1983 by Paladin Press, written under the pseudonym Rex Farrell. The book purports to be a guide on how to be a successful hitman, covering a range of topics from the logistics of slaying for hire to practical advice on avoiding detection by law enforcement. Its publication sparked debate about the responsibility of publishers in distributing content that could potentially be used for criminal purposes. The manual delves into various aspects of the profession, including surveillance techniques, effective methods for ending a target, strategies for creating false identities, and tips for evading the police. It's written in a cold, instructional tone, with no moralizing about ethics. The book treats its subject matter with a disturbing level of detachment, presenting the quote-unquote business as just another profession. Unfortunately, a number of real-life slayings were linked to the usage of the book. Fortunately, these criminals were caught because the advice in the book may not have been the most accurate. And that brings us to the unsolved mystery. Who is Rex Farrell? Well, according to an investigative report published by the Washington Post in 1998, Rex Farrell may have been a mother of two who cobbled together the work on the basis of, you guessed it, movies. 
Alternatively, or in conjunction with the above theory, I would suggest that the book may have been a honeypot. I can only imagine the fastest way to end up on an FBI watch list in 1983 was to go to your local bookstore and inquire about this supposed manual. And once again, in conjunction with the above theories, or perhaps alternatively, the book may have simply been intended as a work of fiction about the life of a hitman. Generally, I would look at a book in my research, but for obvious reasons, I didn't go seeking out the PDF for this one, and I haven't actually read the contents. Gloria Ramirez, The Toxic Lady. Gloria Ramirez, dubbed The Toxic Lady, became the center of a medical mystery on February 19, 1994, in Riverside, California. Ramirez was admitted to the emergency room of Riverside General Hospital with symptoms of advanced cervical cancer. However, the situation escalated bizarrely when hospital staff began falling ill after being exposed to her body fluids. On the evening of her admission, Ramirez was extremely ill and confused. Medical staff noticed an oily sheen on her body and a fruity, garlic-like odor that they could not identify. When a nurse drew blood from Ramirez, the syringe seemed to contain manila-colored particles, and the smell emanating from her blood was described as ammonia-like. Shortly after, several staff members attending to Ramirez began to suffer from symptoms like fainting, shortness of breath, and nausea. A total of 23 people became ill, and five were hospitalized. The hospital declared a code hazardous material emergency. Ramirez was isolated and the emergency room was evacuated. Despite efforts to save her, Ramirez died from kidney failure related to her cancer approximately 45 minutes after her arrival at the hospital. The bizarre incident led to investigations by several agencies, including the Department of Health and Human Services OSHA, and the California Department of Health and Safety. Initial theories ranged from Ramirez secreting toxic substances due to her cancer or treatments, to mass hysteria among the hospital staff. However, none of these explanations fully accounted for the physical symptoms experienced by the healthcare workers. The official explanation, provided months later by scientists at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, proposed that Ramirez had been using dimethyl sulfoxide, DMSO, a solvent used as a powerful degreaser and also as an alternative medicine to relieve her pain. They theorized that DMSO in her system might have built up because of her urinary blockage caused by her cancer. Oxygen administered by paramedics could have converted the DMSO into dimethyl sulfone, DMSO2. Then, in the ER, the electric shocks administered during attempts to resuscitate her could have converted DMSO2 into dimethyl sulfate, DMSO4, a highly toxic substance known to cause paralysis, delirium, convulsions, and damage to the heart, liver, and kidneys. However, this theory is entirely dependent upon Ramirez actually using DMSO and an extremely unlikely chain of events. The death of Gloria Ramirez still remains a medical mystery, with the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory theory being, in reality, more of a hypothesis. Zombocom. Zombo.com, pronounced Zombocom on the website itself, is a website that became an internet phenomenon due to its unique content and mysterious purpose. Launched in 1999, it features a simple flash animation accompanied by a voiceover welcoming visitors to Zombo.com, a website where, quote, anything is possible. The site's minimalist design consists of multicolored circles pulsating in the background, while the voiceover repeats a message of endless possibility and welcome, without offering any specific services, products, or information. Zombocom was apparently created as a satirical take on the early internet's overly optimistic and often baseless hype surrounding the potential of websites. 
In the late 1990s and early 2000s, the internet was burgeoning as a commercial and social space with many websites promising revolutionary services and experiences. ZomboCom is theorized to have parodied this trend by creating a site that promised everything, but delivered nothing whatsoever. The mystery surrounding ZomboCom stems from its intentional lack of purpose or explanation within the website itself. Unlike other websites that evolve or update to maintain relevance, Zombocom has remained virtually unchanged since its inception, further contributing to its status. This consistency raises questions about its continued existence and the intentions of its creator. Speculation about Zombocom's purpose ranges from it being an art project, a social experiment, or simply a long-running joke. At any rate, the days of websites promising the world and delivering nothing are long over. So perhaps the real mystery is why this website is still maintained. Alternatively, Zombocom is going to be doing something real big real soon. Remember, anything is possible at Zombocom. The only limit is your imagination. Sesho Seki, the Japanese Killing Stone, the Japanese Killing Stone, known as Sesho Seki, or the Death Stone, is an infamous object in Japanese folklore. Located in the Nasu region of Tochigi Prefecture, this volcanic rock is said to be able to kill anyone who comes in contact with it. The legend of the Killing Stone is closely linked to the story of Tamamo no Mei, a beautiful woman who served in the imperial court of Emperor Toba during the 12th century. According to legend, Tamamo no Mei was not merely a woman, but a nine-tailed fox who had transformed into a human. She was eventually exposed as a fox demon causing the emperor's illness and was hunted down by warriors. According to the legend, this fox spirit was said to be employed by an evil warlord intent on securing the throne for himself. After being killed, her spirit became the Sesho Seki a stone that emits poisonous gases, killing those who come too close. Over the centuries, the Sesho Seki became a symbol of curses and the supernatural in Japanese culture. It attracted visitors and pilgrims, some drawn by curiosity, and others by the desire to experience the spiritual and eerie atmosphere surrounding the stone. The site where the stone sat has been marked by Shinto practices with people offering prayers, incense, and other rituals to appease the spirit of Tamamo no Mei and ward off bad luck. Also, I'm not sure if it's correct to speak about the stone in the past tense now, but in 2022, a significant event occurred. The stone split in two for no apparent reason. The cause and meaning of the breaking of the Killing Stone became subject to significant speculation online in 2022 and since. I wasn't able to find any meaningful information on how common it is for a large volcanic stone to just spontaneously break like this. Perhaps this is a routine occurrence with large volcanic stones. If this is within your area of expertise, I would love to know the answer in the comments below. At any rate, the local government had Shinto priests conduct a purification ritual soon after the stone broke, so hopefully that took care of any evil fox spirits that were released. That said, in the months following the breaking of the killing stone and the alleged release of the fox spirit, Shinzo Abe, the former Japanese prime minister, met his untimely end at the hands of an assassin. These two events have been hypothesized to be related in some circles. However, no evidence whatsoever has been offered to support this theory. The Urang Medan. The Urang Medan is a purported ship at the center of a maritime mystery. However, the story is shrouded in uncertainty regarding its existence and the events that supposedly transpired aboard. According to widely circulated accounts, the Urang Madan was found adrift in the Straits of Malacca, or the Dutch East Indies waters in 1947 or 1948, 
with various sources providing conflicting details about the timing and location. According to accounts, the ship may have been traveling from southern China to Costa Rica. According to the story, a distress call was received by several ships, indicating that the crew of the Urang Madan was dead, followed by indecipherable Morse code, and a final message, I die. When the ship was boarded by the crew of the Silver Star, an American rescue ship, they allegedly found the entire crew of the Urang Madan dead, with their faces frozen in terror and no visible signs of injury. Some proposed causes for this event have been hypothesized. One theory suggests that the ship was involved in smuggling hazardous chemicals or nerve agents, which were inadvertently released, killing the crew and leading to the ship's destruction. Another theory involves carbon monoxide poisoning, resulting from malfunctioning or poorly ventilated boilers, which could have killed the crew without leaving visible marks. However, this does not fully explain the reported expressions of terror on the faces of the deceased. More speculative explanations have included paranormal phenomena, such as ghost ships or extraterrestrial intervention. In my view, the real reason for the mysterious and unexplainable circumstances surrounding the passing of the crew is that that event did not exist. A cursory search of the evidence indicates that no ship called the Urang Madan was ever registered anywhere. Further, there are no maritime insurance records associated with such a ship. However, these inconsistencies could potentially be explained away by the collapse of the Dutch East Indies and records being lost in the process. What cannot be explained is the Silver Star, the alleged rescue ship. The Silver Star was supposedly an American ship. However, there are no records of a ship by this name being active in the region. Further casting doubt on the story is the lack of any consistent details about the ship. My verdict on the Urang Madan can be summed up simply. To quote Jonathan Frakes, this one is pure fiction. It was invented in a writer's room. It's a lie. It's not true. We made it up. The woman in the polka dot dress. The woman in the polka dot dress is a figure associated with the ending of Senator Robert F. Kennedy, commonly known as RFK, on June 5, 1968, at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles, California. This unidentified woman became a focal point of conspiracy theories and investigations due to witness accounts that placed her at the scene of the slaying, suggesting a potential involvement in the events leading to Kennedy's death. After RFK was shot by Sirhan Sirhan in the hotel's kitchen pantry, several witnesses reported seeing a woman wearing a polka dot dress in the vicinity before and after the shooting. These accounts describe her as appearing to be in her early 20s, with a distinctive polka dot dress. The most compelling testimony came from Sandra Serrano, a campaign worker for Kennedy, who claimed she saw a woman and two men, one of whom she later identified as Sirhan, entering the hotel together. Serrano's account included a chilling detail. Upon exiting the hotel after the shooting, the woman in the polka dot dress appeared to be excited, allegedly stating, We shot him. We shot him. When asked who was shot, she purportedly replied, Senator Kennedy. Despite the gravity of these witness statements, the Los Angeles Police Department and the FBI conducted investigations that concluded Sirhan acted alone. And no conclusive evidence was found to link the woman in the polka dot dress to the assassination. The lack of physical evidence coupled with inconsistencies in witness testimonies led authorities to dismiss the theory that she was involved in a larger conspiracy. To this day, the woman in the polka dot dress remains an enigmatic figure with no confirmed proof of her existence. In terms of what actually happened here, this may have been a case of mass hysteria in light of an extremely traumatic event. Alternatively, the woman in the polka dot dress may have had some sort of breakdown in response to witnessing the act. 
I find it hard to believe that someone involved in a conspiracy of this nature would exit the hotel hooting and hollering about successfully pulling off the act. If you made it this far, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I'm constantly creating new content for you to enjoy. Also, if you want to be a true Chad or Chadette, join the Patreon or Lazy Chill Zone YouTube membership club. All the cool cats are doing it. Check the link in the description. Shout out to my patrons Noah Schubert, Kazak Cutie, and Kurt the Squirt. Until next time, stay healthy and peace out.